Amen. <clears throat> Good morning, church. Welcome. Alleluia, sing Hosanna, it is Easter Sunday. Welcome to all of you. It's so good to see everyone here today. Um, if we're, you're worshiping with us at home, we invite you to click on the contact card. The information is in the Facebook post or in the YouTube post. You can let us know if you have joys or concerns that you'd like for us to pray for you for. Um, <clears throat> our congregation's final worship service is next week. And there are still some invitations, the postcard invitations that are lying on the tables out here. So please feel free to take one of those or as many as you need. Um, we want to have the service open to everyone who has a connection with the congregation. And we want to have this sanctuary full for, for the final service. Uh, today we are collecting our Easter offering. It goes to Disciples Mission Fund. There is a flyer about that in your, in your bulletin, and there's also an envelope. This goes to support all of the ministries across the general church. Are there any other announcements? Okay, let's enter into worship. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Please rise for the call to worship and our hymn of praise. Please join me in the call to worship. Darkness gives way to light. Violence gives way to love. Despair gives way to hope. Death gives way to life. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. You may be seated.
The light which the world tried to extinguish cannot be put out. Today we light the Lenten candles again, proclaiming the transforming power of God. As the light returns, we give thanks that God's transforming love has been, is now, and will ever be with us. Today we celebrate new life, new joy, new possibilities. Christ is alive and living among us. In relighting these, in relighting these candles, we acknowledge that there is still pain and suffering in the world, but we place our trust in God and in the way that's shown to us by Jesus Christ. In the midst of darkness, there is light. In the pain of death, there is life. In the face of what seem to be overwhelming odds, God is at work in us and in the world, moving us toward justice and peace, compassion and love, and life abundant. Christ is risen. Christ is risen in us. For wherever we gather in his name, he is there. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. And the people said, Christ is risen indeed. We come to our time in the service where we gather together at the end of a busy week. We've had much that's happened to us during that time, joys and concerns, and we offer you this space to share with everyone here. As you say, as you, as you offer up your joy or your concern, I will say, God, in your mercy, and you are invited to respond, hear our prayer. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Wonderful. Well, we have a number of friends and family here. Welcome to you all. It is a joy to see you and to worship with you. God, in your mercy. Are there others? Faith. Okay, we lift up Kevin for health concerns. God, in your mercy. Are there others? I just want to lift up a joy and a concern. It is my deep joy to have served as your minister here over the last two and a half years. And it is also, you have my admiration you have my love. I want you all to know that as we go into this final week and, and into the last months that we will have here in this facility. So that is, my, that is my joy. That is also my concern. God in your mercy. Let's bow and go to God in prayer. God of resurrection and new life. God whose love is without limit. We rejoice in your presence on this most holy of all mornings, the day that we celebrate the power of your love over death. Make us bold as we strive to see what you would have us to see, to hear what you would have us to hear, to believe in your truth, and most of all, to run, empowered by you, into the world as a voice and a force for love and justice and wholeness. God, hear the cares of our hearts as this congregation lives and breathes and moves into its final days. Help us to remember always that even in death, there is the promise of resurrection, that there is hope, that you will bring forth life from even the unlikeliest of places. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Our scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel according to John, chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the, the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels sitting in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabune, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not hold on to me because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. May God add blessing to the reading and to the hearing of these words of Scripture. At the young and hopeful age of 21, fresh out of college, my spouse Chris traveled from small town Ardmore, Oklahoma, to New York City. He had a job interview with the book publisher Simon & Schuster, big dreams and a lot of nerves. The air, as he describes it, on 6th Avenue smelled of exhaust, and the city, with the taxi cabs zipping between the lanes, honking horns, and the people, so many people. Chris stopped to get his bearings, searching for the address, and then bam, he backed right into someone. And Chris wheeled around to apologize, and he recognized the woman called out her name. He blurted it out, really. Mary. The odds of a boy from Oklahoma bumping into anyone that he knew in New York City on his very first day are fairly slim, but he recognized this particular familiar face. This Mary was the actress, Mary Tyler Moore. Suddenly, New York City didn't seem quite as overwhelming, quite as impersonal. Everybody loves Mary. She didn't know his name, but Chris, <laughs> but Chris knew hers. Everything was a little more right in his world after that. Thank you, Chris, for letting me share that story. Now imagine how our Mary, Mary Magdalene, must have felt in the uncertain pre-dawn of that first Easter morning after the trauma and the grief of the crucifixion, John's gospel shows us Mary of Magdala alone in the garden. It is still dark. The stone is gone. Jesus is gone. Mary runs to tell Peter and the beloved disciple the news, and they too run to the tomb. Jesus indeed is no longer there, so they go home. 
but not Mary. Mary stays at the tomb and weeps. Mary imagines that the body of her beloved teacher has been stolen, perhaps defiled and disgraced even further. When the two angels appear, Mary doesn't really even acknowledge that they are anything out of the ordinary. Angels in all of their glory ignored. Can you imagine? When Jesus himself appears in the garden, Mary Magdalene sees him, but she doesn't know him. Jesus speaks to her, but still, Mary has not even a flicker of recognition until, until Jesus says her name, Mary. And the truth unfolds before her. Our three daughters are forever scolding me for misspeaking their names, calling Jillian Kelsey and Kelsey Caitlin, and sometimes calling the cats by the girls' names and vice versa. <laughs> I know that these are just subconscious slips, but to them and to most of us, our names are a very important part of who we are. MRI scans of our brains show that when we hear our own names, our brains light up differently than when we hear other words, even other names. Our own names are special. They contain a little bit of our essence. Jesus knew Mary by name, and that changed everything. When Jesus said Mary, her world began anew. In my mind, the sun must have risen it must have risen. The sun must have risen above that tomb at that very moment. Hearing this one word exchange between Jesus and Mary takes me back to an early, earlier time in the Gospel of John. We hear Jesus telling the parable that's often called the Good Shepherd. The sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. It almost seems that at the moment when Mary hears her name, she comes back to life, that she's resuscitated, no, maybe resurrected. Each Easter, I do take a moment to remind myself that resurrection is not merely resuscitation. Resurrection is different. Resuscitation is more like CPR. When someone is resurrected, though, they're not just reanimated. Resurrection brings about transformation and life and change. When Jesus calls Mary, it is a resurrection of source, a new beginning, because resurrection brings about a new and alternate way of being. Like Mary, I think we yearn to be reassured that we are known by God, to hear our names, we may look around us for signs that God is real and for signs that God cares for people, even people as seemingly insignificant as we are. But God can seem so far away sometimes. Sometimes we even begin to wonder if God is real at all. And then we hear the whisper of our own names. God acts in some way, large or small, and we are reborn as children of the resurrection. I can't live without the gospel, the good news of a God who knows our names. And here are some of the reasons. First, I find it completely amazing that God sent Jesus to show all people just how much God wants us to find our way back, back to a real relationship with the holy. That's actual, factual love and forgiving grace. Second, I can't live without the good news that Jesus always roots for the underdog. He stands by the poor, and he includes those who are excluded, even by organized religion. If Jesus can stand up for God's justice all the way to the cross, then perhaps the least that we can do is to advocate for others where we can, whether it's in conversation, on social media, or even in the voting booth. It's the right thing for us to do as bearers of the gospel, the one that insists that we are all God's good creation. Every single one of us is created in God's image, reflecting diverse and unique and beautiful facets of the holy. Third, Jesus taught his disciples and us to pray about a kind of salvation that starts here 
on earth. He didn't want people to wall themselves off in a cave to wait for salvation to come to them. Salvation doesn't exist in an out-of-body escapist, otherworldly experience. Jesus was flesh and blood, God incarnate right in front of us, and the disciples as well, us as well, flesh and blood. And that means that we've got some work to do here on earth to improve everything on earth as it is in heaven. We just prayed this morning. Fourth, Jesus doesn't work alone. He had his community of disciples with him. He was always surrounded. The early churches sprang up and were built on helping each other to live lives that were full and complete. They were there for each other, and so we should be also. You know, at some of the roughest times in my life, I've heard Christians in the communities of faith that I've belonged to call my name and remind me that they cared, that I mattered, that I mattered to God. And I have found myself at those moments in the presence of the holy. That's the good news. And finally, Jesus promised us life everlasting if we would commit head and heart hands and feet to do our human best to follow his footsteps. We need to hear this good news over and over and over again to be re-infused with the gospel and then to learn to live like resurrected people, people who believe all that they've heard and experienced. When we gather together as church, we're reminded our world can feel like an unwelcoming and unsafe and uncertain place, especially when we face the realities of illness and death, divorce, abuse, loneliness even, and deep pain. These, these are the times when we want someone to come after us, when we want someone who loves us enough, not just to resuscitate us, but to resurrect us. We long for God to call us by name and to safely bring us home. And that's why God sent Jesus, in a nutshell, to find us, to speak our names and whisper us, whisper us, whisper us back to God. I believe God speaks your name and mine each day of our lives to reassure us so that we can put aside our fear and our hesitation so that we can be the kind of people that this world needs us to be. We just have to listen for it, hear it, believe it. Easter is a reminder of whose we are, of who we belong to. It is just one day on the calendar, but it's one where we may be able to hear that voice of God just a little bit more clearly, a little stronger, a little louder. And then we leave this place reinvigorated once more to start on the paths of our resurrection lives. Hear your name, listen for God, and rejoice. Amen.
Now we, time, we come to our time at the table, the time of offering and the time of communion. I want to reassure you that God is still at work in this world. God is still at work in this congregation. He's renewing, remaking, resurrecting, and bringing hope through the faith and the gifts and the work of the church. We dedicate these gifts that you brought now, the Easter offering for the work of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, and also your tithes and offerings for the work of this congregation as we strive to leave a legacy that is faithful to God. Please rise as we dedicate the morning's offerings. may be seated. The Lord's Supper is celebrated in our worship weekly. It is central to disciples and it's open to everyone who is a follower of Jesus Christ. The Lord's Supper echoes the Passover feast when Jesus shared bread and wine with his disciples on the eve of his crucifixion. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we meet the living Christ here, and we receive him in the sharing of the bread and of the cup. Here we affirm Christ's presence. Here we find wholeness. We are fed and sent into the world to love our neighbors, to mend fences, and to also heal the fractures in this world. All are welcome at God's table. We invite you to partake. Let us pray. Ever-present God, on this Easter Sunday morning, we gather to renew and strengthen our commitment to you. As we eat the bread and drink the cup, we are thankful for the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, your Son and our Savior. We know of his death, nailed to a cross for you at a public crucifixion. We celebrate the resurrection of Jesus who died for the sins of humanity, that through the belief in him and the acceptance of what he taught, we too may have eternal life. For God and the Lord Jesus Christ, in the Holy Spirit that dwells within each of us, we are truly thankful.
On the night that Jesus gathered in the upper room with his friends, his disciples, he took a loaf of bread, giving thanks to God, he blessed it and he broke it and he shared it with his friends, the disciples. He said, take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in like manner, Jesus took a cup, he poured it, once again, giving thanks to God. He said, this cup is the covenant renewed in my blood. Each time that you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, remember me until I come again. The table is set. Partake in love and enjoy. The joy of the resurrection is too big to keep for just one day a year. So I hope that you will listen for God's voice, listen for Christ as you go about your daily lives. It's an everyday thing that we do, living these resurrection lives. Please rise as we sing our final hymn.
May the joy and the excitement of this day go with us. May the power of Christ's resurrection also go with us. And may Easter promise and hope go with us as we live and love and act and serve all for the glory of God. Amen.